little bit about um, me and Sabrina. Webnographer is an agency that actually specializes in UX data. Um, but data is actually really the easy part. What is really, really hard is the why. But uh, there's a big myth going around that you can't actually discover the why from data. What? Who's got the... Oh, <laughs> who's got the controller? <laughs> <laughs> Come on, who's driving our presentation? <laughs> okay. So, um, actually, trying to... Uh, there's a big myth that you can't actually discover the why um, from... Um, from data, but actually what we'll talk about tonight is actually there are me multiple methods that you can actually use to actually discover the why. And uh, some of the talks previously have covered s some of the, the methods, but we'll go into detail. Okay, so um, one question we had is uh, why numbers? And the question, uh, why numbers for UX? And the question today is really why not? Um, we've actually now got the 20th anniversary of Nielsen's, Nielsen's famous law that we only need to test for five users. You don't have to worry about all the other people who you might be testing because um, there's a big diminishing return. You can run lots more tests, but you're not going to find out more. But actually, there's quite a big challenge if we still uh, believe this today. And I think. Yeah, I mean, the basic thing when Nielsen did this 20 years ago, uh, he came up with this constant, which is 31, uh, 0.31. And what that basically says is the visibility of the issue is about 30%. And over these last 20 years, we, we've really learned about design. There's really fantastic designers. And if you look at computers 20 years ago, they're clumsy. A lot of them were what uh, Sabrina calls black screen of deaths. Um, uh, even the web 10 years ago was really poor. And so what we actually see nowadays is a massive improvement in interaction design and also the users. I mean, 20 years ago, my mother didn't use a computer. Nowadays, she's never off a computer. Um, it's, it's the way things are. And numbers are also, I mean, yeah, we can <laughs> go on to, yeah. Yeah, so the key to understanding Nielsen's why five is he really is just saying that any issue that has a visibility of 30%, you need five, pe five people and you discover 85% of the issues. So we're not even trying to quantify. Now the problem is, once we start looking at um, all the issues that have a visibility of less than 30%, and actually the majority of issues have a visibility of less than 30%. So what we get is this huge gap. So we've got, um, the red line is lab testing, and here we've got, um, oh, we've got actually got a mark the 20%, yeah. but basically, we've got a huge gap of issues that we're actually not discovering that are staying hidden if we decide to only test with five users. If you test um, with 80 users, you can actually discover most of the issues. And so this chart here is based on the theory. So this uses Nielsen's theory. Now, we also got some data. Okay. Do you want to talk through? Yeah. <clears throat> so when we actually look at um, actually finding issues in the wild, what we actually get is we get, um, <clears throat> if we use the, the lab test, sorry, the test with 80, we're at this level up here. Yeah? All of these issues are the ones that are discovered. <coughs> when we only test with uh, five respondents in the lab, we actually only get um, the long tail. Yeah? We're only discovering... We're only seeing 56, well, half of the picture, basically. We're missing the other half. All the other interactions where we have a visibility of less than 30%, um, we're not even seeing those issues. And we're missing half in the picture. Now you may say, OK, that's fine. We don't test for five users. We know we need a bit more. We test with 10. Actually, the picture is still terrible. You're still missing 45% of the issues that people can have. And what you can see here also mapped is um, you can see most of the issues actually have a visibility of around 5%. And it doesn't mean that they're not important. It just means they happen to less people, but they can actually be very critical for what the business goals are. Actually, that 5% issue may be the one that's going to drive your KPIs up if you fix it. It may be losing you those very important sales. So just saying, oh, it only has a, got a visibility of 5%, we don't have to worry about it, it's not the case. That's actually what most of the most of the problems are hiding for, for customers that frustrate them significantly. Oh, the, the, okay. Yeah. No, okay. 
So the other thing about using a lot of data, now one thing we actually have to, we have to stay away from each other. Okay. <laughs> okay. One of, okay, so this is, we deal, we deal with remote stuff. So okay. one thing to be really, really clear is um, what we're talking about when we're actually talking about remote is actually going in and actually trying to use remote to actually identify the issues. A lot of remote studies just try to say what percentage of people completed, but what we normally do when we actually go out is actually try to identify each of the individual issues, and we'll go into a tiny bit and how we do that in a tiny bit. The other great thing about why testing with la large numbers of people is important is um, you reduce your margin of error. But we're still dealing with instrumentation error and we're still dealing with a number of other issues. So margin of error actually just means how important is this issue? I mean, okay, so if we have, a, as we say, we have 50% of uh, people who it happens to, how significant is it? Um, how right or wrong are we potentially with this issue? Yeah. Or how confident are we that it is really important? Okay, so why should we actually care about the why when we do quantitative research? And actually, it's really interesting, some of the questions that already came today, um, also from the audience, uh, I think already illustrated quite well why we need to know why. So that we've got the A-B test, we'll make a change. Uh, the A-B test it told, it was told us it's going to be better, but then after two or three weeks, suddenly with the results are the same. So we made a change, we didn't know why we, we thought it was better, um, and in the end we found out it wasn't. So it's actually, why do we need to know the why? Um, there's two reasons. One is, um, Without the why, the quantitative research is pretty uh, powerless. It, it, you're not going to have much um, strength of actually pushing change through. If we know that 50% of people fail doing something on our website, what can we do with that information? We don't know what is actually causing it. So we need to understand the why. And it's, it's very dangerous, which we'll come to in a tiny bit later, when you try letting kind of like an A-B test make the decisions for you. Is the green bottle better than the red bottle? Oh. Unless you, yeah. yeah. It's dangerous, is the next one. Yeah. <laughs> no, we're into CP Snow. Uh, um, okay, so CP Snow. It says it's dangerous. Okay. So, yeah. <laughs> okay. So C.P. Snow um, was a mathematician who also, a scientist, who also wrote books in their spare times. And the one thing that really frustrated him was the lack of joint knowledge between both the science and the humanities. And I think what we've got to do is make, really reach out and actually make sure that both sides really understand each other. And without one, they're danger. Yeah, so the quality of research without being able to quantify it's dangerous, it can lead us to wrong conclusions, but equally the other way around, it's the numbers without understanding the why is also dangerous on leading us to wrong uh, conclusions and decisions that we make for the business. So, now the magic question is, how do we actually get the why from the numbers? Um, and uh, James already mentioned in the introduction, yeah, we can get lots and lots of data, and we saw or, or heard already today is we can get our hands on data in so many places now. We've got the whole big data movement. We have so much more data, but how come we're not learning that much more? And it's because it's actually hard to get the why. One's got to do the thinking before you start the testing. So, um, yeah, we've got lots of data, but how do we get from just having the data to actually getting to information knowledge and wisdom where we can generalize. And this, this chart is one that you'll see quite a lot, but, and it's a very much oversimplification and it has got issues with it, so do not attack us, but it goes around a lot. So basically, the data is the easy bit, and as in our office we often joke about data, um, but you need to be able to convert the data to actually something useful and actionable and something that you can actually tell the client, this is what you need to change. So. Uh, those two guys are going to, they're Help quite us. old and they're dead, but they're really important. Okay. Um, one of them is Socrates. Ask questions. You need to ask the question before you carry, um, look at the data. Um, and Karl Popper went on, I mean, a lot, of, a lot of people don't understand him, and that's one of the biggest problems with Karl Popper. But one of the things that he said is that you have to prove the hypothesis and the negative. Um, he was somebody who came from a society, I mean, he was brought up in Austria, he was, uh, I think, Jewish. He had to deal with the whole Nazism and communism, both 
claiming that there are signs. So what he was trying to do is he was trying to say, what is science and what is not science? And what he came up with is that you have to come up with a hypothesis that's proven in the negative. Yeah? How so can I be wrong? If you have a question and you can only be right, anything you answer to it shows you're right, then you're not having your hypothesis. Then you, it's not science. But if you have a question and you can have an answer to it that shows you're wrong, then that's considered scientific. For example, I mean, we've got the famous thing of all swans are white. That's quite, uh, or are all swans white? We can prove or disprove this. We can gather lots of evidence for white swans. We can be pretty certain that there's only white swans, but actually finding black swans in Australia will show us actually we were wrong. But we get, had a good hypothesis the where we were able to be wrong. So that's really important. And just to go back to Socrates, it's having the question before you start your research. So a lot of things that we're seeing is people just collecting data, just because, because we can, it's super easy now. But actually, the way you record the data, as, um, as Simona explained on like biases, um, in the context you recorded, all that affects how we in the end interpret the information. If we come up with our question after we recorded the information, we can come up with pretty we can prove anything, as someone said today. Yeah. But actually, we need to define beforehand what do we want to find out, how do we want to record it, why are we recording in this way, and how can we be wrong? That's the most important thing. It also gets really dangerous when you start doing a lot of k-means analysis and clustering that you see. It looks very beautiful, but I, I mean, I was with somebody uh, earlier this year in America who was dealing with hundreds of millions of users. And the thing was that people were moving around the clusters. So they thought they had a good cluster set, but then people would dance over to the other clusters. So what was it actually telling them? It, was, it really was not telling them. It, it wasn't giving them any information. Yep. There's nothing that they could do about it. So how do we come up with those hypotheses? How do we come up with those theories that are going to help us? Why should a button or a line be blue or green? I mean, what's the theory behind why the red or the blue line works better? We actually need to, def we need to come up with this hypothesis before we go out and test it. And, oh. Yeah, okay, so everybody's good. Okay, <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm going okay. to skip okay. it. So, I mean, the hypothesis, I mean, everybody's talking about hypothesis. And I mean, we got the whole Eric Ries, Steve Blank, the lean startup movement. Lead with a hypothesis, okay? And we basically call this having a theory first rather than a theory last. A lot of the things with usability is we're taught to build up and create the theory as we watch the users. But when we actually start playing with data, it's really important to have the theory first. And this is really what the, start the Lean Startup movement is saying. And then we can also look back into things like Nobel Prizes. You don't get the Nobel Prize until somebody actually uh, proves it with the numbers. You can have the theory first, but you don't get the prize until somebody actually gets the numbers yeah. and proves your hypothesis. And everything's based on hypothesis. People come up with a theory. They spend years trying to find evidence for it and also how they can be wrong. And it's all based on data. But there's a lot of thinking, a lot of testing, a lot of being wrong that then helps us to actually understand and conclude how the world actually works. So how do we do this for UX? Well, uh, there's four ways how we can get hypothesis for our uh, UX research. One is the design is the hypothesis. We have other data. We have stakeholder views, people in the companies um, that, that, that you make, may do research for or within your own company where you're researching. And we also have um, different review methods as hypothesis. And the design is kind of, of how you write. Um, and then we've got the stakeholder views and um, review efforts thinking, how can we be wrong? And other data like survey data and web analytics is kind of in the middle. So how does the design as the hypothesis work? Well, when the designer designed the interface, they thought that the user would behave in a certain way. Based on that assumption, they created a process that they then implemented into the interface. This is the designer's hypothesis of how the world works. Um, so here we have uh, something we call the optimum path when we do carry out our research. So a lot of the uh, way we're testing our hypothesis of design is doing uh, remote usability testing where we can 
track each step that the user goes through. So we can actually see and evaluate the design hypothesis, the optimum path, the shortest way of getting to the information by running a usability test and evaluating, okay, well, we thought people would behave this way. Are they actually going through those steps? Are they reaching the end? Can they make the purchase? Or are we losing them somewhere? And if we're losing them somewhere, then we know actually we're not, we weren't right in our assumption. Okay. Then there's a lot of lostness. So when people, once people get lost of the optimum path of the design hypothesis, we don't really worry about all the other parts they go around in the interface because really no one wants a scenic route. If I want to pay a bill, I just want to get it done with. So if we then look at why and how uh, to improve the interface, it's looking at that one step where the person got lost and not worrying about the other, st the other steps. It's about um, really helping the person to find the shortest path in the interface. <clears throat> then we've actually got other data. So we've got things like sur survey data. We can actually, lab testing is very good for generating a hypothesis. And we've also got things like web analytics data. Web, web analytics data can actually help you generate the hypothesis. But what it's really difficult to do is actually, it's not actually showing you where the problem actually has, and it doesn't quantify the problem. Yeah, but it has a lot of interesting ideas of how and why something can work a certain way. So having this data, we can come up with a theory and say, well, this is how we think things work in the interface and how people understand stuff. We can go and test it. We can try different design routes and see, well, is this actually true or maybe we had the wrong assumption. But that's fine. Being wrong is actually the most interesting thing when you test your hypothesis. Being right is kind of boring. Um, then we have the stakeholder hypothesis. So. <coughs> You know, you got the person in the organization who says, this stuff doesn't work. People are doing this. And there's a lot of information that you can get from the different stakeholders. The programmers, where they believe something is wrong. You can get stuff from the marketing people. A lot of people believe, have massive arguments sitting around uh, big tables costing the client a lot of money. Saying, And these are all great hypotheses. But uh, as we keep like saying, data um, really beats opinion. And we got to actually go out there, and we can actually test the opinion. Yeah. The remote methods and data collection methods are really getting so cheap nowadays. We can go out and collect data and prove opinions right or wrong. It doesn't really matter. So we're quite terrible. Yeah. <laughs> so you would say, if you come to a client and everyone's arguing, what a terrible situation. We're like, great. Everyone has an idea of how they think the world works. So we collect those opinions, those ideas, and also there's a lot of knowledge in those organizations, and we use those as the hypothesis. It's actually way more interesting when people are quite opinionated about how things work, because we can go out and test it and get the data to support I mean, the, it. There's a great guy who predicted the US uh, election um, called Nate Silver, and he really encourages betting within the organization, and actually getting people to put money up and actually say, I believe this is what the user is actually doing, and they actually put their own money towards it, is a great incentive for actually encouraging hypothesis thinking. We're still trialing that somehow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Working on it. <laughs> okay. And then this is actually, I think, another really, really interesting way of getting our hypothesis. It's the stuff we're actually really familiar with in UX. We know about review methods, such as uh, the realistic evaluation, the Nielsen's 10-point checklist. Um, doing a cognitive walkthrough, asking ourselves at each step the four questions about does the user understand what they can do here, will they understand what to do next, what actions are available. We can use those uh, heuristics and go through the process um, at each step of the process of the, our design hypothesis and come up with additional uh, theories of how we think the user may get it wrong. Um, we know an interface has to give feedback, so if we go and do our uh, review on an interface and see there's no feedback, we've got quite a good idea of how things can go wrong. So that's becoming quite strong now theory of how we think things are going to um, go wrong. And just to say, we haven't even started any data collection yet. This is all before we do anything. So this is all pre-thinking the theory before we do anything. So just to summarize, it's how do you create the UX hypothesis? 
Yeah, I mean, it's very, very important to write it down. It's also very important to really think about how you can be wrong, because that's actually where you're going to get the answer. I mean, you get really kind of a lot of ones, like bland ones, like um, users believe the design is good. I mean, you can't quantify that. I mean, there are different ways of quantifying it, but it's hard to quantify it. You want something like users, and does it matter if they believe it's good? I mean, if they can actually complete their goal in the time they want, is that what matters? And you kind of got to ask, really have strong questions and strong ways that you can be wrong. Yeah. Um, so and this is, yeah. All the stuff we're kind of talking about here is behavioral research. Because we can ask users, do you think you completed the goal successfully? And they may say, yes, it was really easy. But actually, they did completely the wrong thing. So we still count those people as failures. They've not been able to complete the goal. And we have to redesign or help the designer to make the changes in the face to help them to get there. And actually, um, if someone thought they were successful but they weren't, there's a really nice term for it, which is the disaster metric. So yeah, it's really behavior rather than opinions that this is really focusing on. Yeah. So we do all our testing mostly through um, the remote method. So it's a, it's a little bit like in the lab. Uh, we give people a task on the website. Um, but instead of being in the lab, we do this actually remotely unmoderated. So people are in their normal environment and behave the way they would normally do. They could be in their office, they could be at home, children screaming around, someone may be at the door, so they're a little bit stressed. But that's great because this is how they would normally use the interface. So this is our, norm, our real conditions in which we can test and evaluate those different hypotheses. But I mean, it, there's a lot of other tools out there. I mean, and we've got here, we've got a couple of them, but we don't have that many of these things that we made uh, for America, which has got all the different remote methods. Because most people are really unsure of what different methods there are out there. I think we've got about four or five of them left. Um, but the thing is, is that you can go out there and collect a lot more data through the different tools. But the data collection, as we've always said, is the really, really simple part. It's actually thinking what the hypothesis is, where people are going to trip over, and then you actually start getting some real insights about what's worth mending and what's not worth mending yep. on the site, how to improve it. So, and just to finish, yeah, now uh, people use the web in so many different contexts, um, so we can't really lab test this. You, we need to use um, more than just the lab and just the five. So you can test it with remote methods, so that's not just unmoderated testing, but surveys, online ethnography, there's so many different tools now that we can use with, with the internet of gathering information from those different contexts. So yes, we, we can collect data easily as long and then if we have our hypothesis with it, we can actually learn from it. Okay. So I think any questions? Okay. Actually, there's actually some data on this. Um, <laughs> um, I think there is. Uh, what's I can't ever remember them. The the ones where they do the uh, the UX method tests every two years and compare them. I don't know. Um, my short answer would be their opinion is a really interesting hypothesis. I would like to test. So what I want to ask is, if you think of a website as a building or a car or a movie or a piece of music, people don't do A/B testings. People don't do A/B testing on those kinds of things. They have expert opinion, so I don't. This is what I don't understand: is why doesn't expert opinion count for anything in user experience design? I think it generates, I think as Sabrina said, it, it acts as a really good hypothesis. And I mean, we do A-B test music. I mean, there's music that's really successful, music that's not very successful. There's a large sample of music out there. I mean, there's a lot of really unsuccessful people, um, what's it called, performing in bands and, yeah. 
and everyone can be wrong. It goes back to how can we be wrong, and even experts get it wrong. And as it's, I think always very, very important to go and test those assumptions. Yes, the expert opinion is based on a lot of experience, so it is very important, but I would still go out and test. They can't account for all the, all the different contexts that we showed earlier, all the different people with different backgrounds. There's always something that you didn't expect. Okay, we have one more question. Oh, hi there, yeah, thanks for your talk. <laughs> so, uh, so I finally understood, actually, just at the end of your talk, why it was that you were talking about performing hypotheses and performing strong hypotheses. Because if you are testing remotely, you have to give strong hypotheses, so that you're testing against a kind of discrete set of, of tasks, and then you can get, you can test those things, and that's what you get out of it. Um, so of course the, the the benefit of having like moderated tests or sitting one to one with somebody, is you can allow your tests to roam and you can kind of pick out, you can follow your nose a little bit and you can test things that you weren't expecting. So so my question really is, doesn't this whole approach that you're following, the whole kind of thesis of your talk really, kind of necessarily constrain the envelope of findings that you can take from usability studies? No, I think both of them actually go hand in hand. I mean. One is, I think, designers play off very much about, I mean, we know that we're very bad at thinking about multiple people. I mean, look at a charity appeal. It's got a baby in the hands, yeah? But um, I mean, instead of like a crowd of a thousand babies, yeah? So designing against one, but I think actually when we actually want to find out what's actually really working on something, we then need to go along and actually do quite large studies and then to allow one then to focus on what works and what doesn't work. So if we take kind of like a large site that a lot of us are working on nowadays, 5% or even 10% issue is actually a serious issue. Yeah? So then, then you can focus it back to the designers to actually solve. Yeah? But to actually identify why somebody's not buying something, why somebody is um, having these problems, Often it's the things that, I mean, I've tested with quite large companies that have only lab tested people below the age of 45. Though, and these were companies that were selling to the whole population, you know? Um, and when you actually go out there and you actually looked at the research, a lot of the buyers that were actually spending money with them were 55 plus. So we've got to be really good and actually be, really get users from everywhere. And people do behave differently. I mean. There's too many times when I've worked with people that they've said, you know, 10 users in Austin will predict how five users in Spain will act. And I can tell you, every country, we have different behaviors. We're not homogenous uh, anymore. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I understand all of that. So do you advocate uh, doing kind of moderated tests as well as what you do? Or it seems to me that... Uh, this, uh, okay, so fire. there's... Okay. You should be creating hypotheses independently of the research you're doing. Because whether you believe it or not, any research you do, you have assumptions of how people behave and who that person is that you're testing with. You need to write those down beforehand. When it's dangerous, and actually this isn't new, I think there was a paper like also 20 years ago that says even if you do lab testing, write down your assumptions because they are basically also your biases. But if you write them down, you can test against them. So you should be tr writing down your assumptions, which we here call a hypothesis, that you check whether they're true or not for whatever research you do. Now, I just want to come back to the other point you made about you can explore stuff with people. Now, when we do a remote usability test, which is very focused on our hypothesis, there's always stuff that we find that we didn't expect. Now, what we would do is run another research project to uh, follow up with it. I mean, it, on remote, it's cheap, it's quick, it, it's not a big deal. What you explained of when you saw someone in the lab test, where you could then just explore it, actually what you're doing is you've come up with a new hypothesis because you found something unexpected that you can't, what, what you did is you explored it immediately with that person. What we would do is take it and do it on the next test. So it's not that different. You can do quite broad research and it find things that you didn't expect. It doesn't matter whether you're sitting next to people or not. Any questions from that side? Anyone? Anyone else from this side? Is that it? Cool. Uh, so thank you so much, Sabrina and James. Uh, thank you too. Thank you.